Hey everyone, thanks for coming by. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 299. And today we're going into our biggest ever profile episode. Today we're going to talk about the man that started Rank and the man who started the very first modern martial art to go into the Olympics. Talking about judo. And of course, I'm talking about the legendary Jigoro Kano. If you're new to this show or my voice, You may not know who I am. I'm Jeremy Lesniak. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick. I'm the host of Martial Arts Radio, and I get to research and talk about martial arts as part of my job. I have the best job in the world, and I want to thank you for allowing me to have this job. If you want to check out the stuff that we make, the reason that we can spend the time on things like this show, you can head on over to whistlekick.com or Amazon. You can find our sparring gear, our ever-growing line of apparel, training accessories, We make it all for you, the traditional martial artist. I want to thank anyone out there who has supported us recently, whether through a purchase or sharing an episode or leaving us a review or any of the other many, many things that you can do that so many of you do do to help us out here at Whistlekick. You can find the show notes for this episode, including a full transcript at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And this is a good one to check out, especially if you're interested in names. I'm going to do my best with all the Japanese pronunciation, but my Japanese, it's not great. I'm trying. All right. Give me, give me a little bit of leeway on this. Okay. (laughs) All right. Let's get into this. Every judo practitioner and a majority of martial artists have surely heard the name Kano Jigoro, the founder of judo. Now, that's using the Japanese custom of placing the family name, what we would call the last name, first. If we were to follow Western convention, he'd be Jigoro Kano. Throughout this article, I'm going to refer to him in Japanese custom and call him Kano Jigoro. Kano Jigoro was a Japanese innovator and educator who introduced the Don ranking and the use of obis or belts to identify someone's rank or expertise in martial arts. These two innovations were later applied to other martial arts, such as Taekwondo, Kung Fu, and a multitude of others. The Judo martial art became a success, and it was the first Japanese martial art to be recognized and accepted internationally, and subsequently became an Olympic sport in 1964. Kano was born on October 28, 1860, in Mikagi, Japan. He is the third son of Kano Jurosaku. His family was famous for brewing sake, and they produced the brands Hakushika, Hakutsuru, and Kiku Masumune. His father, being an adopted son, didn't want to continue in the family business. Instead, he decided to work in a shipping line. Marushiba then met the boy Tomita Tsunajiro in Amagi Mountain during a business trip. Because he saw cleverness, deviousness in the boy, he brought Tomita to Tokyo. This boy then became Kano's follower in judo many years later. When Kano's mother died when he was nine years old, his father moved the family to Tokyo. Kano's father highly valued education, so he enrolled Kano in private schools. Despite his frail body and his small height, he excelled academically. In 1873, Kano was enrolled in a private British school where he hoped to find someone who could teach him jiu-jitsu because he was frequently bullied. However, he failed to find someone. He even asked Narai Basse, a former government knight and a family friend, and Katagiri Ryuji, their villa's caretaker, to teach him jiu-jitsu, but both of them declined. Moreover, Kano's father insisted that he should take his studies seriously and should not waste his time practicing a vulgar and dangerous martial art like jiu-jitsu. In 1877, Kano enrolled in the University of Tokyo, a newly established university from the merging of Kaisei School and the Tokyo School of Medicine. He entered the Faculty of Letters and became friends with Keito Takaki, who later became the 14th Prime Minister of Japan. During that summer of the same year, while he was walking along the Ningyocho Street, he saw a sign saying, Yagi Tenosuke, or Bone Setter, which kind of sparked some interest. See, at that time, most bone setters also practiced jujitsu. Yagi's house was very simple and only had one room that served as both the consultation room and the bedroom. Nevertheless, Kano persuaded Yagi to teach him jujitsu. Yagi, who was in his 50s, was bewildered by Kano's request. Then Kano explained that he really wanted to learn jiu-jitsu to develop his frail body. Yagi was convinced with his reasoning, really saw the passion in him, and was delighted that Kano wanted to study the martial art. 
He told Kano that he was certified in jiu-jitsu from Tenjin Shinyoru, but he had no dojo and he'd already retired from teaching jiu-jitsu. Fortunately, though, Yagi had a friend named Fukuda Hachinosuke who studied in the same school, and it was to him that he recommended Kano. Fukuda accepted Kano as his student and practiced in his small jojo. Kano practiced jujitsu every day. There were times that trainings were canceled due to Fukuda's illness, but that didn't stop Kano from training. His follower, Tomita Tsunajiro, became Kano's partner in practicing jujitsu during these days. What motivated Kano to learn jujitsu was when one of the students brutally punched him for the simple reason that he didn't like Kano. At that moment, he didn't retaliate because he knew he had no match for the attacker, primarily because of his weak physique. So here we see, even though Kano started training, he's not quite ready, he's still being bullied, and this is an archetype story that goes back well over a hundred years. The same stuff that so many people deal with now was going on then. The way Fukuda taught his students was more in practice than in theory. He would briefly explain the techniques and then let the students practice freely and learn through actual experience. Once the student became proficient with the techniques, Fukuda would only teach kata, or movement patterns. It was very challenging because there were no special mats like the ones we have today, but only ordinary straw mats that provided very little safety. Back then, their training clothes had short sleeves and the trousers were quite short. It was inevitable to be scratched with these clothes on the straw mats as Kano trained vigorously. Because of this, he plastered the wounds and he used a strong-smelling poultice. He was teased by his schoolmates who called him Sticking Plaster Kano. He didn't mind this, but what made him anxious was his senior student named Fukushima Kenkichi, who went to the same dojo. See, Fukushima weighed 90 kilos, while Kano was only 50 kilos. Fukushima was not only big and strong, but he was also excellent at jiu-jitsu. He sometimes replaced their master as a substitute teacher. Now, at first, Kano saw no means of defeating this guy. However, he took it as a challenge, and he didn't stop thinking and researching. He researched European physical education, sumo wrestling techniques, and European boxing and gymnastics. Researching back in these days was really difficult, especially when you're looking at jumping languages. But Kano was so enthusiastic and read more and more books in English until one day he finally found a technique that he thought could topple Fukushima. Kano, being an analytical person, carefully watched the movements of Fukushima during one of their training sessions. Then he politely asked Fukushima to have a match with him. Kano started by keeping a distance from Fukushima of about six feet, pretty far out when you're talking about jujitsu. Fukushima asked Kano why he was doing this, and Kano just said he was waiting for him. Fukushima got irritated, so he took a step forward and quickly dove down on Kano. Kano immediately used his newly devised technique, and Fukushima's body flew in the air. He fell so badly that he hurt his back. When he got up, he humbly asked Kano about this movement. Kano proudly said that he was considering calling it kataguruma, or shoulder wheel, which is now included in the traditional 40 throws of judo. When U.S. President Ulysses S. Grant visited Japan on August 5th, 1879, Shibasawa Aichi, a well-known businessman and philanthropist, arranged a jiu-jitsu demonstration in his summer residence in Asuyama. Kano was one of the people who was invited to this jiu-jitsu demonstration. Fukuda Hachinosuke and Iso Mateemon Masatomo were also there, as well as his best friend, Godai Ryusaku. Kano and Godai performed randori, or freestyle practice. According to Kano, it was perhaps the best day of his life during his stay at the Fukuda Dojo. Sadly, in that same month, Fukuda's body gave up from illness and passed away at the age of 52. At that time, there was no decision who would replace Fukuda as the master of the dojo. Since Kano was the only one who had good knowledge of both randori and kata, he was asked by Fukuda's wife to serve as the new dojo master. It was basically impossible for Kano to decline Mrs. Fukuda's sincere request, so he accepted it eventually, even though he knew he wasn't equipped to take such a huge responsibility. And with the promotion, Mrs. Fukuda also gave him the dojo's manuscripts. Kano's desire to improve his skills in jiu-jitsu didn't stop when Fukuda passed away. He enrolled in Tenjin Shinyoru, a famous school of jiu-jitsu founded by Iso Mateemon Masatari. At that time, 
The headmaster was Iso Masatomo, who was 62 years old. Iso was a well-known expert in kata, but not so much in randori. Iso appointed two of his best students, named Sato and Muramatsu, during the randori training sessions, so Kano was able to improve his randori skills. Because he had drastically improved his skills by training hard, not to mention his solid experience in the Fukudo Dojo, he was eventually assigned to be an assistant instructor in Tenjin Shinyuru. There was also a time when Kano had a chance to perform randori with the students of Yoshinru, one of the schools that emerged from Tenjin Shinyoru. He was amazed by the skills of the Yoshinru practitioners, particularly with Totsuka Hikosuke. Kano then realized that his skills weren't enough to defeat a jujitsu practitioner as brilliant as Totsuka, so he trained smarter, not just harder. He did this by combining the knowledge of different ryu, or schools, to come up with better techniques. I'm going to go off script for just a moment here because there's something I want to make sure everyone's hearing, everyone's understanding. We've got several examples now of where Kano approached a martial arts challenge intellectually. He didn't just go in and train hard. He didn't just get stronger. From his early days as an academic, as a good student, he recognized the value of his intellect as part of his martial arts training. And that's something that I don't think a lot of people are willing to accept for themselves. Martial arts is not just the physical piece. We talk about that on the show. Martial arts is also mental in however you want to define that. The ability to look at martial arts through more than simply physical practice, but also intellectual practice, at the very least, comes up as an important element here in this story. Now back to the script I have. The Master Iso died in 1881. Iso had several manuscripts that Kano studied. He also consulted some masters of the old schools in Tokyo as he wanted to improve his jujitsu skills. Determined to increase his knowledge, he bought many jujitsu books from the bookshops that were sold at ridiculous prices. In the same year, Kano graduated from Tokyo University but pursued graduate school afterwards. He also got to know Ikubu Tsunatoshi at Kitaru, who was around 48 at the time. Kano learned throwing techniques from Ikubu, which he deemed better than what he learned from his previous schools. In January 1882, Kano got a part-time job as an instructor in Gakushin while he was still in graduate school. A month after, he established his own school, which he called Kano Academy. Kano realized in just a few weeks that he needed more space as the number of students grew, so he rented rooms at a Buddhist temple called Aishoji, where he also resided. Eventually, the head priest of the temple told Kano to stop using the rooms as a dojo because the rooms had taken damage already. And on June 5th, 1882, Kano founded the Kodokan Judo in this temple. Kano finished his graduate school in July 1882, and he was hired as a full-time instructor in Gakushin in August 1882. His first salary was 80 yen a month, which was substantial at the time. However, he also needed to support the basic needs of his student servant, Tomita, and he needed to buy expensive foreign books for his studies. Therefore, he could not afford to build his own dojo with the money alone. So, Kano got a part-time job from the Ministry of Education by translating an English book into Japanese. Kano spent many sleepless nights just to finish the translation. He was paid one yen per page, and he used this money to build his own dojo with 12 tatami, or mats. And this was the very first Kodokan dojo. At Gakushin, since the students were of an elite social status, the teachers were forced to visit the students' homes whenever summoned to render extra service. Teachers were treated as servants. Kano didn't approve of this, so when he became a principal, he was able to implement his ideas and methods that he acquired from the European and American models. He believed that teachers should command respect. In 1883, Ikobu issued a teaching license to Kano, the very first that he had received. Even though he already had a license, Kano found it difficult to find students, at least at first, because of his young age and his insufficient training facilities. Remember, 12 mats. Ikobu visited Kano in his classes and exchanged knowledge and techniques. At first, Kano was usually defeated by Ikobu, but eventually, Kano improved his skills and defeated him more frequently. Kano told him that one should break the opponent's posture first before applying the throw. And it was then that Ikubo told him, You're right. I'm afraid I have nothing more to teach you. 
Ikabubi stole all the books and manuscripts of the Kitoru to Kano shortly afterwards because he wanted Kano to succeed him. Kano had the utmost respect for Ikabu, and he retained some of the old techniques that are now called the ancient forms, Koshiki no Kata, even after Ikabu died in 1888. The term Judo was originally coined by Terada Kanemon, the fifth headmaster of the Kitoru. Kano revived the term in 1884, which means gentle way or way of softness. He also interpreted it as the, quote, most efficient use of energy. The way Kano created judo was by combining the different techniques from ancient schools, such as Shibakawa-ru, Tenjin Shinyo-ru, Toda-ru, Sekiguchi-ru, and Kito-ru. He explained in 1888 that he only preserved the few basic elements from these schools, so it was just called Kodakan judo. It does not have any origin of place, unlike the others, and that makes it unique. Judo was then introduced to public schools starting in 1906. The Kodokan had a series of transfers as the number of students grew considerably. After the 12-mat dojo in 1882, they moved to a larger space with 60 mats in April 1890. Four years later, they transferred again to a larger space in Tamazaka Cho. In November 1897, they moved to a 207-mat space, then to a 314-mat space in January 1898. More than three decades after that, on March 21st, 1934, the Kodokan transferred again to a larger space with 510 mats. Then, in 1958, the Kodokan transferred to its largest by far, 1,200-mat facility with eight stories. Now that is a dojo. In March 1922, Kano established the Kodokan Cultural Association, Kodokan Bunkakai, and its first meeting was held at Seokin Hotel in Tokyo on April 5th, 1922. Its first public lecture was held at the YMCA Hall in Kanda, Tokyo. The association's objective is to be contributory to the society through the principles of Kodokan Judo. As Kano taught, the most basic principle of Judo is, quote, the most efficient use of energy, where most efficient means to avoid waste and to uphold virtue, and energy pertains to both physical and mental power. He also mentioned that Judo is not merely a martial art, but its principles can be applied to all aspects of human affairs. Kano tirelessly promoted judo all his life, but he earned through his job as an educator. In January 1891, Kano accepted the offer of Ministry of Education as a counselor, though he didn't dream of really being one. It was just something that kind of happened. And just several months later, in August of the same year, he left the position to become a dean at the Fifth Higher Normal School, which is now Kumamoto University. Kano married Takazoe Sumako in his early 30s, and they had six daughters and three sons. Takazoe was the daughter of a former diplomat and Chinese literature scholar, Takazoe Shinichiro. In January 1898, Kano worked again for the Ministry of Education as the Director of Primary Education. He left for Europe in August 1899 to study for about a year, and upon his return to Japan in 1901, he served as the President of of Tokyo Higher Normal School until 1920. He also founded the Nara Middle High School at Kobe, Japan, which later became one of the top schools because of its extremely difficult entrance examination. Kano was also a member of the International Olympic Committee, the IOC, for over 20 years. This started when he was requested by the Ministry of Education to represent Japan in the 1912 Olympics. Aside from that, he co-founded the Japan Amateur Sports Association and served as its first chairman. As he was very active in the IOC, he was a significant figure in promoting the Olympic sports among the young Japanese. Kano was also one of the organizers in the Far Eastern Championship Games held in Osaka in May 1917, and he represented Japan at the Antwerp Olympics in 1920. He was not active in the Far Eastern Championship Games in Osaka in May 1923 or in the 1924 Olympics in Paris, but he was already active from the 1928 to the 36 Olympics that were held in various countries. As Kano is one of the most respected figures in Japan with regards to physical education and could be considered an authority in Japan's participation in the Olympics, he did not try to make judo an Olympic sport. He said in his letter to Gunji Koizumi in 1936, this is a quote, I have been asked by people of various sections as to the wisdom and the possibility of judo being introduced at the Olympic Games. My view on the matter at present is rather passive. If it be the desire of other member countries, I have no objection but I do not feel inclined to take any initiative. For one thing, judo in reality is not a mere sport or game. I regard it as a principle of life, 
art, and science. In fact, it is a means for personal cultural attainment. Only one of the forms of judo training, the so-called randori, can be classed as a form of sport. In addition, the Olympic Games are so strongly flavored with nationalism that it is possible to be influenced by it and to develop contest judo as a retrograde form as jiu-jitsu was before the Kodokan was founded. Judo should be f- as free as art and science from external influences, political, national, racial, financial, or any other organized interest. And all things connected with it should be directed to its ultimate object, the benefit of humanity. Kano's health started to deteriorate in 1934 as he suffered from kidney stones. Still, he managed to attend some important events in Kodokan and in the Olympics, and the last Olympics that he attended was in Berlin in 1936. He died on May 3, 1938, in the middle of the sea, in the liner Hikawa Maru, during a business trip as a member of the IOC. Pneumonia was the cause of death officially listed, but there was an allegation that he was maybe poisoned or suffered from food poisoning, but there's no evidence to support this. Before his death, Kano promoted Mifune Kyozo to ninth Dan in 1937. Mifune was considered by many to be the greatest judo technician ever after Kano. Around three decades later, judo was officially introduced in the 1964 Tokyo Olympics. The greatest legacy of Kano was not actually the martial art itself, but his idealism that changed the manner of fighting in Japan. And in this regard, he was compared to the Marquess of Queensbury of England. It was beautifully written by the journalist Mark Law in his book, The Pajama Game, A Journey into Judo. Dr. Kano's Kodokan rules for his version of jiu-jitsu brought a new, safer kind of fighting to Japan in the same way that the Queensbury rules, introduced some two decades earlier in 1867, did for boxing in England. Both the Marquess of Queensbury and Dr. Kano transformed their sports, making them cleaner and safer. One man took the grappling out of boxing, the other took the boxing out of grappling. One worked with a padded fist, the other with a padded floor. In the latter years of the 19th century, the martial histories of Eastern and Western civilization had reached a point at which two men at opposite ends of the globe produced, within a few years of each other, the rules which were to herald unarmed combat's own age of enlightenment. There is certainly a lot there in the history of Jigoro Kano. Kano Jigoro, Dr. Kano, whatever you choose to call him, his contributions to the martial arts cannot be overstated. Here is a man who, as far as I'm concerned, ushered in the modern era of martial arts, the approach that so many of us look to, the importance beyond the physical. For me, the intellectual element of martial arts, so many things that I look to as important, started with Kano. And this is where I'd like to hear from you. Whether or not you're a judo practitioner, I want to know your thoughts on this man. You can email me, jeremy at whistlekick.com. You can make a comment on the show notes page at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Or you can find us on social media at whistlekick. Always love hearing from listeners. And if you have a suggestion for a future episode, whether that be a guest request or a topic for a Thursday show, please fill out the form at the podcast website and we'll go ahead and see what we can do. I want to thank you for your time today. Thank you for listening. Until next time, train hard, smile and have a great day.